this town ain't big enough for the both of us. We know what to expect when we hear that phrase. This town is going to lose a population. There are grievances that have been aired. There is a difficulty that must be reconciled. There is satisfaction that has been demanded. But what we don't expect is for a town to lose that population by someone willingly stepping away. This town ain't big enough. Well, you're right. So I will leave. You can have it all. You can take the best parts. Take everything that you need. And that's exactly what we see Abraham do. We've been learning a lot about this man who is so influential, three of the world's largest religions to this day, that he uh, demonstrates to us faith, that he is our example in following after God. Just a few chapters after God called him in the book of Genesis, he has this confrontation with his nephew named Lot, where there are too many animals, not enough land to sustain them all, so there must be a separation. So Abraham doesn't, at this time, pull rank or anything like that. He's like, well, you know, Lot, I'm the one that God, God called out of her. No, he doesn't do that. He says, Lot, you can take whichever land you want. And Lot certainly does take everything that he wants. And so he goes to this, this land uh, that's, that's really good, but the difficulty in wanting the very best of something is that you're rarely alone in wanting that. And so Lot goes to this land that's good, and soon after he gets there, he's settled just outside of Sodom. Soon after he's there, there's enemies that come. Kings from surrounding cities come and form an army and conquer and capture and, and kill and, and take everything, including Lot. He's carried away as a prisoner. Abraham hears about this, and as you can imagine, he's not very well pleased. And so he forms as many fighting men as he can. He forms them together, and it's far inferior in numbers, but he still is able to chase them just about the entire length of this, this land that God promises to give to Abraham's descendants. He eventually catches up to them, and in a very unsatisfying amount of details, we're told that with this inferior army, Abraham conquers them, he retrieves everything, nothing is lost. So coming back from this victory to, to this land that, that uh, he was settled in before, he's, he's walking and he comes uh, across this, this valley, which to the original audience would have sounded very familiar. I know the King's Valley. That's just outside. And he's confronted, or not confronted, but he's, he's approached by this man who's named Melchizedek, who is said to be king of Salem, a city that would eventually be renamed to Jerusalem. He's not just a king in this place, but he's also called a priest of God Most High. It's like, oh, well, maybe that's just what he is calling his God. But then Abraham, in that same conversation, says, the Lord, God Most High. So somehow, just a few chapters after God called, him, uh, called Abraham to follow after him in a different place, there's a man who is a priest of that very same God. That's interesting. Well, in this role as priest, uh, Melchizedek comes to Abraham and he blesses him. And Abraham pays him uh, in return by giving him a tenth of everything that he had with him. And this sounds very much so like the tithe that God would ask or would require of those to pay to the Levites, to their priests. But this is well before then. That's really interesting. And then we hear nothing. That's it for Melchizedek never hearing anything else about him. We don't even hear his family line, which we always hear when someone is following after God. This person, son of this one. But here it's Melchizedek, son of... Oh. But what we see in this man is someone who is king in the very place where God would set up his king over his people in Jerusalem. But he's also a priest in the very place where God would have a temple set up. And then we never see those two roles united again. There are kings, those who can represent God to the people, who can enact God's rule over them. And there are priests, those who can represent the people to God, those who can give them the way for them to be saved, to be in right standing with God. 
but they're never united together in Israel's history. And we see some of the difficulty of this. We, we have these kings who are holding people accountable to, to the, God's laws, but they're not able to provide any sort of means or, or guidance for those who fall short of those laws. And then we have these priests who are able to offer sacrifices so that, that sins could be covered, but they don't have any ability to lead the people or, or care for them or, or enact their safety and security. So we have this deep disconnect between these two roles that we see in Melchizedek, but we never see again in Israel's history. It's why we get to David in Psalm 110 in this time of prosperity and peace for the nation of Israel. And he's looking out at this place underneath his leadership, and he doesn't say, oh, this is the best there will ever be. No, he says, there will be someone who comes who's greater. There will be a priest again like Melchizedek, who can be that priest king, who can represent God to the people, but also represent the people to God. We get to Hebrews and we see that there is one who does come like that, and that one is Jesus. In Hebrews, we've seen this kingly language used for Jesus. Uh, back in chapter 2, we saw that Jesus is crowned because of his work. He's seated at the right hand of God. And lately, we've been talking about the priesthood of Jesus, how because of his work, we can have access to God. We see these two roles together. He is both priest and king. There's been a lot of conversation about priests in this section of Hebrews. It's, it's an entire uh, section that runs from part of chapter 4 to part of chapter 10. Uh, and in it, we've been talking about what a high priest does, this role to uh, offer access between God and man. Because all of us, all of us are not as close to this God that we are, as we are designed to be. And each one of us has this, this part of us that, that craves for more, to be known by this God and to know him as well. Every person is, is feeling this separation, this missing out that we were meant for in our creation, in our intention, but we aren't able to do that. God is so perfect and holy and good, and we are so sinful and broken, and so we cannot be in, we cannot have that access to God. We cannot be in relationship with Him as we are intended to be. So God created a way to bridge that gap, to offer someone who can intercede for us, representing people to God. And this was the high priest originally. But there's a lot of limitations about this. This was uh, one day of year this person could enter into the presence of God and only this person could do it. And there's lots of rules. They had to come from one specific family. There's, there's a lot of regulations that they needed to follow so that they could be worthy enough to enter into God's presence. We are that separated that only one person could go through all of this rigor in order to represent us there. So one person in only this one place at only this one time could intercede, could give the means for people to be reconnected with this God. And that is the role of the high priest. And I think that we've been missing something. I don't think that we are impacted as much as the original audience was about all this discussion about priests. And it's been a lot of discussion. Again, it's multiple chapters throughout it. And we might nod and be like, yeah, that's good. We got Jesus. That's great. But I don't think it's hitting us as, as much as this original audience was. And part of that might be because we don't or maybe haven't had a priest. Sure, some in here may have grown up in the Catholic Church where that title of priest is still used, but it's a little bit different. See, for the Israelites, it was the high priest and only through the high priest that someone could have a, be in right standing with God that they could be reconnected with them. Their entire spiritual life, their entire forgiveness of sins came down to this one person. I think about it like with our apocalyptic movies. So there's one person who can do all of the work so that humanity can be saved. Whether this is Bruce Willis blowing up an asteroid that's pummeling towards the Earth, or uh, Randy Quaid crashing his jet into an alien spaceship in Independence Day, or whatever it was Matthew McConaughey's character was doing behind the bookshelf in, in, in Interstellar. Uh, in each one of these situations, one person is doing all of the work so that humanity can be saved. That's the type of hope 
that's placed in the high priest. Now, God's not threatening to destroy the world and this one person stops him. That's not it at all. But again, God is so pure and holy and good and we are so sinful and broken, but we need to be reconnected with this God. Our entire lives depend on it. And through one person is that bridge able to be formed. Through one person interceding on behalf of humanity, can we be reconnected with this God? Our hopes rested on this one person. It's why we have so many instructions uh, throughout uh, the Bible, especially in the first couple books, about how priests are supposed to act and operate and behave and, and all of that. that. All this care and time that's placed into the priesthood uh, that, let's face it, when we get to that part of our Bible reading plans, we could be honest, it's pretty easy to skim over those parts because they're a bit tough to follow through. There's entire chapters on just what priests were supposed to wear. I pick out my outfits for Sundays in the dark and just hope I don't embarrass myself, but we have whole pages of instructions about what priests were supposed to wear. This shows us the care and seriousness and the need to take this, this uh, uh, in a very responsible way. Even the attire of a priest mattered this much in order to be able to do this role. That's why we have this entire section in the book of Hebrews talking about priests, because it's only through this one that this bridge is able to be formed. It's only through this one that this, uh, this, this need to be known by God and to know this God can be quelled. And as we're reading through this section, I hope it can help us see as well that we need a priest. We too are separated from this God. We too have this gap between us. We too have this, this need to be known by him. And there's no, there's no part of us that can bridge that gap on our own. There's no part of us that can make up that distance that we feel so much, uh, we feel so removed from him. And without a priest, well... It's like we're in an apocalyptic movie without a hero to save us. Now, before we run out trying to find a priest and checking prices on cattle to offer for sacrifices, uh, Hebrews 7 does tell us that despite the seriousness of this priesthood, the care that was placed into it, the goodness that it could offer, that it was insufficient. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. It says, now if per perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, this priesthood that we're talking about, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, one, or rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So if, if this first priesthood that we've been talking about was perfect, well, why do we need another one? And not, it's from completely different order, a completely different type of priesthood, one like Melchizedek rather than one like the one that was given before, the descendants of Aaron. If that was perfect, well, why would we need another one? And then Hebrews 7 goes and talks about the different ways that we see that this first priesthood was not perfect. We talked before about how while the priest could represent the people to God, they couldn't represent God to the people. That while they could offer sacrifices for the covering of sins, they couldn't actually lead people inside of that. And we see throughout Israel's history when there are kings who cannot, uh, who cannot save and when there's, there's priests who cannot lead, what happens is Israel gets further and further away from God. Then Hebrews continues. They talk about uh, one of the shortcomings of this priesthood, and, and this was uh, something that was shared with all the priests. They died. So they, this vital role that every priest needed uh, to do for every person to bridge this gap, to quell this feeling inside of us, there came a point where they couldn't do it anymore, and we needed to repeat it. We needed to do it again and again. And it also says here that this priesthood couldn't lead to perfecting anyone. There was the covering for sins, yes, but that needed to happen again and again and again and again had to keep happening over and over. And what was even more important is there was no power given to anyone to try to live for God more so. It was just a covering for sin. There wasn't an actual ability to follow after him more. So we see throughout Hebrews 7, the shortcomings 
of this priesthood. But as we're reading through it, it helps us see so desperately how much we need a priest. We need someone to bridge the gap between God and us. And here is where we have hope. And we've been talking a lot about hope as of late. John was here last week, and he, he helped see us the hope that we can have because of Jesus. We've had phrases throughout the book of Hebrews, the, the certainty of hope that we can have. Our boasting is in this hope. That word keeps coming time and time again. But as we see this priesthood that falls short, as we see this need that's in all of us, there's the hope that comes because Jesus is part of a greater priesthood. He is a priest of the order of Melchizedek. He is that unique combination of both priest and king. He can represent God to the people and the people to God. Look at verse uh, 18. It says, For on the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. So we have this old system, and it's been set aside, and there could be mourning. There could be loss because of that. But on the other hand... A better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So that, that longing that's in all of us to, to know and be known by this God, this, this gap that is between us and Him, this, this complete separation, we are able to draw near to this God because of this priest. So we can have hope because Jesus is this unique combination of priest-king. Okay, but why? Why does that give us hope? We've been talking a lot about hope. We've been talking about Jesus as a priest. Why does that give us hope? I think this is what the rest of chapter 7 is talking about. That Jesus as priest king is sealed by God's oath. Jesus as priest king can save us completely. And Jesus as priest king is perfect and eternal. So why do we have hope? It's because he is sealed by God's oath, he can save us completely, and he's perfect and eternal. So let's walk through those together. So how can we have hope? Well, it's Jesus as priest-king is sealed by God's oath. Look at verse 20. It says, It was not without an oath. For those who were formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one, Jesus, was made, a, uh, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord is sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So in, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, we had these priests who came into this, this role. And, and remember, we talked about the, the incomplete importance of it, how serious it is, and how significant it is, how much every person needs it. And yet that wasn't sealed with an oath from God. He talks about, how, how much care we're supposed to give to it, how important it is. But it isn't God swearing an oath. He's not making a promise about or for that priesthood. But when Jesus becomes a priest, it has this oath with it. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever, he says to Jesus. Okay, so why does that matter? Well, remember what we talked about, their connection with the priests. This was the one who their entire spiritual lives were, uh, came down to. Their entire ability to be saved came through this person. Their entire relationship with God was because of who this person was. This was their Bruce Willis. Dare I say, their Randy Quaid. And so now we have this new priesthood that's given. And you've got to think that there's questions. Well, how do we know that this won't happen again? How do we know that this priest won't fail us like priests and before have? How do we know that God won't change his mind and bring in some new, new covenant? Because it's sealed with God's oath. And we know in our lives, time and time again, we see God keep his promises. We see throughout the, book of, uh, throughout the Bible, and, and especially last week in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, we saw there is no greater thing by God to swear by than his own name. And so we see that the promises that God makes, he will keep. So we have this one who God says can bridge the gap between us and him, who can intercede for us. And we can trust that he will continue to do it because God has sealed that priesthood with an oath. And that gives us hope. 
How do we have hope? Well, Jesus as priest king can save us completely. Let's pick it up in verse 25. It says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to, him, uh, near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love Melchizedek. I think he's such an interesting character. Uh, there, there's, there's so many things about him that I'm curious about, and so I've done a ton of study about him. There's a part of me that didn't even want to mention him today. And I get that that's counterintuitive because that's the whole point of this section, but I, I'm concerned that our questions or wonderings about him will get in the way of this. And we probably have lots of questions about him. How could this random Canaanite be a priest of God Most High? Uh, Hebrews talks about how he has no mother and father. Is this the mother of immaculate conception? Talks about how uh, Levi paid tithes while in Abraham's loins. That's really weird. What's going on there? And, and these are really good. We should ask these questions in our life groups. Because anything <laughs> that... Anything that takes us away from verse 25 is taking us away from the point of the passage. And not just that, but the beauty of the passage as well. Let me read it again. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I know being relatively new to this role, I'm making mistakes and certainly am making mistakes. I'm grateful for your patience with me there. Uh, there was a real temptation to come up, read verse 25, and then just leave at that point. I think that would have tried your patience too much. Uh, I was also a little bit afraid that people would have come up like, best Sunday yet. And like, okay, <laughs> that's not great. Uh, but the temptation was there because of how beautiful this verse is. Because of how succinct and perfect it is. Because here we see Jesus work for us, both in terms of quality and duration. Jesus can save us to the uttermost. And he can do this because he is always making intercession. We have the quality there and the duration. Jesus can save completely to the uttermost. There is nothing we need to do to ensure that. There is nothing we can do. There's nothing we are capable of doing to save ourselves or save any part of us. This isn't we just kind of add a little bit to the work that Jesus has been doing. Like when you're at a diner and your cup of coffee is getting a little bit cold, so you just need that little bit more to just touch it up, to warm the whole thing. But you know, the coffee is already there, the mug's already there. You're just doing a little bit to, to touch it up. That's not it. Jesus saves us to the uttermost. This isn't some uh, immaculate landscape, this beautiful masterpiece on a canvas that, that's all done. Jesus just hands you the brush and says, just need you to do a couple of the final brush strokes. That's it. That's not it at all. Jesus saves us to the uttermost. We are not prep cooks where we need to uh, just chop everything, arrange the ingredients together, get them in like little individual ramekins. That's not it. We don't contribute anything here. Jesus saves us to the uttermost, completely, fully, to the brim. Whatever adjective you want to throw in there, that is the work of Jesus for us. Jesus saves us to the uttermost. And he's able to do this because he is always making intercession. He is always doing this. Jesus, as our priest king, he's bridging that gap between us and God, who is uh, representing God to man and man to God. He is doing that always, at all times. There is never a point when he has stopped doing this. This isn't like the cable company that gives you a window in which they might do some work. This is Jesus working at all times. This isn't like a health clinic, which is closed on the weekends, which is great because apparently humans are immortal on Saturday and Sunday. This is Jesus working at all times. This isn't waiting for one day a year to go into the presence of God to intercede for us. Jesus is interceding always. 
So we can have hope because we have this priest king who can save us completely. There's no need to top it off. There's no need to offer animal sacrifices. There's no need to try to work really hard to earn God's love because he has fully saved us. And he is always able to intercede. There's no wondering, will God still love me for this? Do I have to wait? Do I have to put things on hold? Jesus is interceding now and always for us. And so we can have hope because he can save us completely. We can have hope because Jesus as priest king is perfect and eternal. Let's finish out chapter 7. It says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sin and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus is perfect and eternal in this. Jesus is not like those other high priests whose uh, ability to intercede, something that we so desperately need, we long for all of us to know and be known by this God. Well, these priests had a point where they could no longer do that. And we had to once again try to find some sort of hero, some sort of person to stand in that gap. There's no need to look anymore because Jesus can be in this position always. See, death for these other priests was the end of their ministry. Death for Jesus was a start of something incredible. And in being like those that they were caring for, these high priests had, had sins themselves that they needed to be covered. But Jesus, in becoming like us who he cares for, well, he gives us a priest who can be sympathetic and relate to us in every way that we we're tempted, and yet he was without sin. So we have Jesus who is perfect, who can be our example, our model to follow after him. Jesus as high priest is able to stand in that gap always. So we see that he has been appointed as the perfect priest forever. Israel had such a close connection to their high priests. It was through them that they could have access to God it was through them that they could have forgiveness for their sins. This person was so important in their life. It's like those heroes in action movies who die so that humans can live. And we have that in Jesus. We have this one who has gone and paid the price once and for all, it says, who died the death that should have been ours, who paid the punishment that we have rightfully earned. We, as we say, know that Jesus died for our sins. But that isn't the end of the story. I mean, certainly that's enough reason to have hope right there, that we have a priest like this who can fully cover our sins. But Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He didn't just die for us. Jesus also lives for us. So what does verse 25 say? He always lives to make intercession. Jesus died for you, and Jesus lives for you as well. That we who so desperately need to know and be known by this God, we who so desperately need someone to stand in the gap between us and God, we so sinful and broken and separated, look at this God so perfect and holy and say, there's nothing I can do to bridge that gap, and Jesus bridges it perfectly, fully, always interceding for us. So we don't have to try to work really hard to earn God's love, wondering, is this enough? Will he finally love me? But we can rest knowing in the fact that this love has fully been given to us already. All we have to do is rest in that love. We don't need to stand on the outskirts wondering, did God see? Did God notice? Am I now kicked out? Do I now have to be removed? Am I now some sort of pariah? But no, we are told that we can draw near to him with confidence because we have such a great high priest. And in all of this, we find hope. 
We have hope because there is now one who not only represents people to God, who can cover those sins, but can also represent God to the people who can lead and guide us along the way. We have hope in this priest king because he is sealed by an oath, because he can save us completely, because he's perfect and eternal. Or as we read last week, the end of chapter six, we have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful. We're grateful that you gave high priests to begin with, that we are people who have earned our separation from you, that we have sinned and sinned repeatedly, that we have gone against your good rule for our life, And you could have easily given up on us, but you provided a way to be reconciled. You provided someone to intercede on our behalf. And yet this just pointed us to the need for something greater. A priest who could not only represent people to you, but also you to us. A priest king like Melchizedek. But you provided that as well. You gave us the way to be seal, or to be connected with you, not just once a year, but always. You gave us a way to to not just have covering for our sins every single time that we offered sacrifices, but you provide a once and for all sacrifice. So as we go, let us trust that you have saved us completely. Let us not try to earn a salvation that's already been given. Let us not try to try to earn affection that's already been poured out. Let us not try to bridge that gap on our own because we can never do it. And there is no need because you have so fully interceded for us. But let us fall more in love and trust of you. Let us grow more in hope that we can endure anything because we have such a great high priest. It's to you that we pray. Amen.